Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for uh, being here today. We have sensed your presence. You have ministered to us in a variety of ways already, and we have sensed that, Lord. Thank you for the music. Thank you for the testimony of one making a decision for you, and thank you for the story and the songs. But Lord, now we want to come and hear a message from your word. So please speak to us, Lord. Please just open our hearts, open our minds, especially as we begin this new series. We pray that we'll hear the message of the hour, and we want your will to be accomplished and your words to be shared. So thank you for hearing our prayer this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Years ago, it was a hot, summer, muggy afternoon in the state of Vermont. A young boy was sitting on a wooden cracker barrel, and as he was sitting there next to the general store, he had in one hand, he had a knife, and in the other, he had a stick, and for several hours, he was whittling away in order to pass the time. Suddenly, to his surprise, the old Times Square clock began to ring. It struck one time, two times, three times. It continued on. Five times, six times, seven times, it continued. Ten times, eleven times, twelve times. After it struck the twelfth hour, it continued to ring. Thirteen times, fourteen times, fifteen times. The eyes of the boy got so big. Startled, he threw the knife down to the ground, and he ran out into the street, and he cried in a loud voice. He said, wake up, everybody. Wake up. It has never been this late before. And friends, those words are so true, aren't they? It has never been this late before in Earth's history. I mean, who would have ever thought years ago that we would have reached the year 2016? I mean, you look at the early pioneers, the Adventist pioneers in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, they earnestly believed that Jesus was coming in their day. But here we are 160 years later, and the Lord still hasn't come back. Yes, it has never been this late before in earth's history. A few years ago, I came across this picture or article about the doomsday clock, and I know many of you are familiar with this. Scientists have tried to estimate how close we really are to the end of the world, and as they used a time clock to quantify it, they looked at what was happening in the world events and what was taking place at that time. Back in the 1970s, they said that we are at Earth's last hour, we're at 11.50 p.m., and that the midnight hour was drawing near. Of course, since that time, a lot of things have happened in the world. We've had the Iraq War, we have the rise of ISIS, we've had the economic downturn, we've had all these things happening in the world, and these scientists have now moved the dial on the clock to 11.59 p.m. They claim that the earth has never been nearer to the end of the world than what we have seen in our day. Of course, we as Seventh-day Adventists believe that, don't we? Can you say amen? That we are living at last hour of verse history. And as soon the final events will unfold, and Jesus will come in the clouds of heaven to take us home. Hallelujah. We believe that. We've been preaching it. We've been longing for that to take place. Since knowing that we're close to the end, the question I ask this morning, how are we to live? How are we to prepare for Christ's second coming? What kind of focus, what kind of character is God calling us to have in these final days of verse history? Well, we can find our answer in two small letters that Paul wrote many years ago. This morning we are beginning a new summer series studying two small books in the New Testament, the Thessalonian Epistles. And I've been praying and I've been excited about this study because what we find is that the issues that the first century Christians were dealing with are the same issues that we deal with in the 21st century. There's amazing parallels between the two eras. Now as we begin our study... We need to have a historical context. 
So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17. Now we'll come to Thessalonians a little later in our message this morning, but I want to be able to provide some background so that we can have a better understanding of Paul's letters. When we come to Acts chapter 17, we find that Luke details for us how the church was started in Thessalonica. What do we know about the city of Thessalonica? Well, first, we are told that it was a highly populated coastal city on the shores of the Asian Sea. It was also a highly idolatrous city. They worshipped many false gods. They worshipped Zeus, Tamus, Hercules, Hercules. Their god, their chief god was Jupiter, which was the father of Hercules. Historians tell us that traveling salesmen would come in and out of the city on a regular basis as they traveled from place to place. When Paul came to the city, he began to observe all the traffic that was coming in and out, and he looked how close it was to the coast. And he began to see the possibilities for evangelism. He said that the salesmen that would come in, maybe they can hear the gospel. And once they become converted, these same men could share the good news of Jesus Christ as they went from city and town, and that's how the work would spread. It didn't take long for Paul to conclude that Thessalonica was a key strategic place to plant a new church. I just love Paul's vision, don't you? He saw that this city was a bastion for the cause of God. And that this would become a center by which could be used, could be a center by which many others can come to know Jesus Christ. Friends, we need to have those same church growth eyes, don't we? We need to be asking on a regular basis as a church, what town, what city could we establish a new light in because there's so many other people around us and around the world that don't know Jesus, don't know his truths. And if something doesn't change, many will go to their graves lost forever. We need church growth eyes. We need a passion of planting new churches across this globe. Well, what happened? What did Paul do when he came to the city? Well, we find here... Once he arrived, look at verses 1 through 3 of Acts 17 as we continue our study here. It says, starting in verse 1, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Now let me ask you, why did Paul suddenly go or immediately go to the synagogue in Thessalonica? Well, he went for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was his regular custom to worship God on the Sabbath. That was, by the way, the practice of Jesus. He got the example from Jesus walking the earth. If you remember Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it says, as his custom was, Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That was the day of worship. That was the practice of the New Testament church. That was the practice of Jesus. And Don, I thank you for the song this morning that reminds us of the beauty of the Sabbath. Why we come together? Because we're worshiping and meeting our creator, our friend, and developing a relationship with him. The second reason why he went into the synagogue, because he wanted to reach his own kinsmen, the Jewish people. He wanted to be able to share the good news with them, which, by the way, would be a good thing for us to do as well. Friends, as we pursue the mission of Christ, our immediate mission field is our family and friends. That's our immediate circle of influence. Those are the ones that God wants us to work with and pray for on a regular basis. And as we focus on them, then we branch out to other areas of the earth. 
Well, what kind of response did he receive? Look at verse 4 as we continue. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. The word brought fruit. Can you say amen? And we have the promise, whenever we share Christ's word, it does not come back void. The Holy Spirit works and plants seed in the hearts of people. Now, I'm sure that the positive response was an encouragement to the apostle, especially as you read in the previous chapters how much he was rejected in the city of Philippi. And so when he came to this city and got a positive response, I'm sure his spirits were lifted up some. You know, God has a way of encouraging us along the way in the work, doesn't he? He would do something small just so that we are reminded of God's working and the work of ministry. I think of when I was doing some call portering one summer. I was doing it part-time when I was in Andrews the first summer. And I would be one of the individuals, the group that would go out selling door-to-door and if you've ever done mega books or call portering, you know that you get a lot of rejections at the door. Amen? And you go down the street, nope, too busy, nope, not interested, doors are shut. And so you can work for hours trying to sell a book. And so I remember one summer, I was one day, I had a hard time selling books, praying, we're all praying. And it was the last home of that day. I hadn't sold anything all day. And then I knocked on that door, and then the the lady on the other side had children. And she said, I'm very interested in your books. And she bought like four or five books. And I left that evening with my heart lifted up because God sent a little blessing, a reminder that he is in the work. And that it's all about what he's doing. And, and he has a way of lifting our spirits. You know, sometimes we can invite our friends and family, come to church, please come and join us for an activity. And we ask them over and over, and they never come. And so our spirits get down some. But then God, with his little blessing, suddenly that friend shows up at church. And they were blessed by the service. God sends that reminder that says he is in charge of the work. We have the TV ministry that's going on a regular basis, and sometimes our, we're wondering if people are watching it, and, and suddenly God sends a blessing that we have several people who will call in and want a lesson or free book that we're offering on the program. God has a way of encouraging us that we are making a difference in this world. And I'm sure that this positive reception in the new city encouraged the Apostle Paul but not all f- responded favorably to his message. In fact, we continue to look at verse 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city crying out, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be known that you're turning the world upside down for Jesus? I mean, that would have been an honor to have that said. It says, saying there's another king, Jesus, and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these sayings. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Paul faced some serious opposition, didn't he? Wouldn't you agree? Now, I don't know about you, but I would not want to be the target of a wild mob. Because you never know what that mob is going to do, right? Before you know it, you could be dead, laying on the ground in the middle of the street. And so, here these brethren, they were concerned about the safety of Paul and Silas. So they sent Paul away, silently at night, to go to the city of Berea to continue the work on there. Now, once Paul was out of the picture, what would they do? What would happen to the new believers in Thessalonica? Here they heard the gospel, or heard here that many responded, would they stay with it, or would they give up their faith? Well, now go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
with that background, now we begin to have a better understanding of Paul's epistles that we find here later in the New Testament. As you read in the book of Acts, eventually you find that Paul arrived in the city of Corinth. And he had lived there for quite a number of months. Now, while he was there, his heart was heavy for the believers that he had left behind. If you've ever been involved in ministry and and helping individuals come to have a better understanding of Jesus in the Bible, you begin to love those people. They become family. Can you say amen? They become special friends dear to our hearts. And so Paul, he had to leave in a hurry, and now he eventually lands in in Corinth, and he's wondering, what happened to those believers in Thessalonica? Are they still doing okay? Are they still in the faith? Had they given up? And you read through Thessalonians, and we'll study that in a couple weeks, you'll see he has a dear love for these people. And he was wondering what was going to happen. In fact, eventually he sent Timothy, his fellow servant, to check on them. Now, remember back in that day, communication was not the best. I mean, they didn't have emails, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have the internet. So Paul didn't know what was happening to the believers. And Timothy comes back a couple months later with a report. And the report had good news and bad news. And after hearing the report, the Apostle Paul pulled out a pen and began to write a letter to his dear friends in Thessalonica. And that's where we get the letter here. I want to look at a few passages. Begin in 1 Thessalonians 1, chapter 1, and look at verses 1 and onward. It says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you thanks, give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord. Notice the next part having received the word in much what? Affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you become examples to all Macedonia and Achaia who believe. From you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Then look at verse 9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, whom Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And then look at another passage. So he's talking about their experience here. Go to the next chapter, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. And he continues on in this introduction of, and reaching out and caring for his friends. Verse 14 For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are on Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men. So he's talking about how much of a struggle it was for these believers. And how they experienced suffering and affliction and and various trials and hardships. Now one other passage, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We'll come to the second uh, letter later. But look at 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 4 and 5. And notice what Paul writes here. He says, So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Notice in these verses, Paul is commending them for their faithful witness. The Thessalonian believers suffered greatly from the Jews and the Gentiles. 
But friends, praise God. They did not allow the persecutions to cause them to lose their faith in Jesus Christ. Which has been the case for many down through the years. Friends, there has never been a time when it has been easy to be a follower of Jesus Christ. By the way, probably the easiest has been by living here in the United States. Because we have had the freedom of religion to be able to worship according to our consciences, and yet, despite all the freedoms, we complain and we gripe and we talk about all our hardships. When you look at the rest of the world, you find that many are suffering from affliction. Many have died for their faith. Many have been tortured. Many have been persecuted. Many have been put to prison. All for the cause of Jesus Christ. And we have it so easy here in this country. Now Jesus gives this warning in Matthew 10. Go over there with me. Matthew 10. He gives this warning. Matthew 10 and verse 16. He predicted that it would not be easy to be a follower of his. Starting in verse 16 of Matthew 10, he says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of what? That doesn't sound too pleasant, does it? He's already warning them before he even went to the cross. He said, if you're going to be a follower of me, it's not going to be an easy path. And he continues on, he says, Therefore be wise as serpent, as harmless as doves, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in the hour in which you shall speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my sake. But he who endures to the end will be what? So Jesus warned us. He said, this is not going to be an easy thing. He says, if we're able to endure to the end, then we not only will be saved in the kingdom of God, but that we can become a witness for those who follow behind us to think that our testimony can be an inspiration for somebody else. Friends, I have to be honest with you, I was moved when I heard the story that was shared a couple weeks ago at Lynette's baptism. I don't know if you remember, right before our baptism, the story of a father who was being asked to deny his faith in Jesus Christ. And the tribal leader, he was, being, he was a missionary, and he was trying to reach out to this tribe, and, and the tribal leader was trying to shake his faith in Jesus, and he said, if you do not deny your faith, I'm going to kill your children. And he said, I can't deny my Lord, and his children were killed. Then they went to his wife and said, if you do not deny your Lord, we'll kill your wife. They killed his wife. And then it came to him, if you do not deny your Lord, you will be killed as well. All of them were persecuted, tortured, all of them died. But you remember in the story, the tribal leader was so moved by his steadfastness in the Lord Jesus Christ that the tribal leader opened up his heart and became a believer himself. And because of that father's witness and because he stood for Jesus, that entire village became believers in Jesus. Friends, we have it easy, don't we? And when I read these trials that the early Christians went through here, like in Thessalonica, my heart cries out and says, Oh God, help us to have that steadfastness in the days in which we live. In an age where we compromise so easily, in an age when we deny the Lord so often, God, help us to make you our rock and our refuge. You are our mighty fortress. Our God, help us to remain faithful to you. Paul was encouraged. Those believers in Thessalonica were not swayed. They didn't give in, but they stayed true to Jesus Christ. And a new church was planted in the name of Christ in that 
coastal city that was worshiping all these false gods. When we think of persecution, who is the one that's really behind it all? Who was the source behind all the resistance and hardship that the believers in Thessalonica faced? Satan, right? Both the Jews and the Gentiles were just pawns that Satan used to stop the growth of the church. In fact, go over to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12. You find that, in fact, Revelation opens up for us the curtain of the unseen world, and we see the great controversy being played out. And we see that there's a battle between good and evil, between truth and unrighteousness. And here in this battle that's taking place, we find that we're in the middle of it. You and I are caught in the midst of this war that's taking place. And when we come to Revelation 12, we see that John gives us a picture of the persecution that goes against God's people. And he began in Revelation 12 and verse 1. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and under her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now what does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? It represents the church, right? We know that based on Jeremiah 6 and other passages. And so we see that the church is the bride of Christ. What does Satan try to do? Look at verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Who's the red dragon? Satan, right? It becomes clear as we read on in the chapter. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. What is he talking about here? The great controversy that started in heaven, a third of the angels were cast down upon the earth. A third, of the, a third of the angels are now roaming this earth. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,200 days. Now, who was this child? It's representing Christ. He was the one who would rule with all nations. And how did uh, Satan try to destroy the Christ child? Through King Herod. Passed a decree that all the babies under the age of two would be killed. Well, God intervened and Jesus was taken to Egypt where he was raised until he came back to Nazareth. And so Satan constantly was persecuting on the heels of Jesus while walking the earth, but he was unsuccessful to cause him to stumble and fall. And after Jesus' death and resurrection, he ascended into heaven. And what did this Satan then do? He turned his arsenal of attacks against the church that Christ left behind. And notice you read in verse 13, as we move on, it says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she has nourished for a time, time and a half a time for the presence of the serpent. Why was Satan so mad against the woman, the church? What was he trying to stop? Satan doesn't want God's love and character to shine forth on this earth. Because he knows that if the character of God and the love of God would be shared to the earth, many would be saved, and he would be lost and destroyed forever. So what does he do? He turns his arsenal against God's people with hopes of wiping them out from the face of this planet. Now, what's ironic is that despite all of Satan's efforts, all down through the years, he started with Christ, he persecuted the church, but as you come to the last days, God's people are still around. There's still a group faithful to him that are allowing God's character to shine through, which makes Satan so furious. How dare they? There's still a people, a remnant, that are sharing God's character with the world. And so we have the last part of the, of the chapter, Revelation 12, 17. 
and the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Friends, Revelation predicts there are difficult times ahead for you and me. Just what we read with the beginning of the Thessalonica church and the persecution that they received in order for the cause of Christ, we see in the very end, the battle only intensifies. And we see that Satan has declared a war against God's people. And this, these attacks are designed to cause us to give up and not be part of God's remnant church in the last days. Friends, he's after you, and he's after me. And that's always been his desire from the very beginning, as we've seen in the book of Acts. This battle is very real. But I wonder this morning, where does our greatest threat lie as a church? in these last days. As I was preparing for this message this week, there was one truth that spoke to me more than any other truth from this study of Thessalonians. The greatest attacks we will face as a people may not ever come from the outside, but may come from within. And I'm not talking about merely compromise of truths either, which, by, by, by the way, in and of itself can be very devastating. Truth is very important. But instead, what I am talking about is how we treat and relate to one another. Friends, do you know, as we think about this, do you know that more people leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church not over doctrinal issues, but many, many people have left because they've been hurt by what someone has said or what somebody has done. Hands down, relational issues are the biggest factor for people leaving the church today. Satan knows this. So guess what he does? He studies us. He looks for the most vulnerable. He brings conflict. He brings gossip. He brings fault finding. He causes people to speak unkind and harsh words. And since they are already struggling in the relationship with Christ, this is the last straw that breaks the camel's back. And they stop coming. And they don't come for year after year after year. They would rather choose to be isolated from the body of Christ instead of keep coming. Interestingly, Jesus revealed this unseemly form of attack in a parable he told just before he died on the cross. If, you have, if we had the time to go back and look at Matthew chapter 24, you find that Jesus gave a stream of parables, six in a row, of how to be ready and watch for his second coming. And in the stream of those parables, there's a parable of the faithful and evil servant. And take time to go back and read that parable. Jesus, in that parable, says there's going to be a delay. And friends, has there been a delay? Absolutely. 160 years of a delay. He says there's a delay in the coming of the master. And during the tearing time, the faithful servant was wise in all of his dealings in the master's household. He was kind. He was respectful to all. The evil servant, on the other hand, pushes off the timing of the Lord's return and loses his focus. He begins to hurt and mistreat those in the master's house. And upon the return of the master, the evil servant finds himself unprepared for the master's coming. Why? Because he became careless in his words and his actions. And so will be the case for us in the final days. Friends, during the tearing time, we need a close walk with Jesus Christ. We need to spend time deep in God's word and studying his truths. We desperately need to be in community and small groups 
where we're being accountable to one another and our journey. We need to be actively using our gifts and ministry. And the quality that we need to pursue as God's remnant people is not only the truths, but we need to have a character quality of love. Love for God and love for one another. The greatest arsenal that Satan will launch among the remnant is from within rather than without. Two quotes. Now, what kind of sparked this whole thinking? I came across this quote. I wasn't even planning on uh, seeing this, but the Holy Spirit kind of leads you to certain things. And this is found from the Acts of the Apostles, page 549. She says, It is not the opposition of the world that most endangers the church of Christ. Now, that caught my attention in this message. We're talking about persecution and the opposition of the early church. She's saying it's not the opposition from outside that most endangers the church of Christ. It is the evil cherished in the hearts of believers that works their most grievous disaster and most surely retards the progress of God's people. There is no sure way of weakening spirituality than by cherishing envy, suspicion, fault-finding, and evil surmising. That spoke to me. I said, we can talk about all the end-time events, and we can talk about the mark of the beast and the financial issues, and we can be all intrigued with that, but if our character is not such that we have love for God and love for one another, it makes us wonder what our focus really is. But then look at this quotation. This is from Third Selected Messages. She says, in the place of turning the weapons of warfare within our own ranks, let them be turned against the enemies of God and of the truth. In other words, in my own words, she's saying, know who the real enemy is. Our enemy is not the one sitting next to us in the pew, right? This is our brother. This is our sister of Christ. I mean, we share the same hope. We share the same vision. We share the same purpose. Instead, aim our machine gun full of ammunition towards the real enemy who's bringing havoc upon the earth and bringing havoc upon the church, which is the devil and his evil angels. Friends, if we do that, we will be united as a Seventh-day Adventist church. The Holy Spirit will be poured out in a mighty way, and we will win the world for Jesus Christ in these last days. I long for that, don't you? As Paul preached in Thessalonica, he encounters some bitter opposition. However, the actions of Christ's enemies did not prevent a harvest taking place. And although Paul was forced to leave the city, a new church was established for the cause of Christ. And it became one of the most important strategic centers in Macedonia. And from this city, the gospel went in various directions. Friends, I am thankful that this is God's work. And I am thankful that God is in control of his movement. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What rock was he talking about? He's not talking about Peter. He was a tiny little pebble, right? If you read this Greek and fine, but it's the rock of faith. Faith in Jesus Christ that he died for us, he rose from the grave, and that Jesus is coming back. Faith and the power that all things are possible through Christ. Faith that, that he has died for our sins and that by believing him, we can have eternal life. We need that kind of faith, don't we? We are in serious times. Persecution will come. It's not a matter of if it will come. It's a matter of when will it come. Amen? Just as with the believers in Thessalonica, trials will arrive in various forms. We see in Revelation 12, he attacked the 
Christ. He attacked the church that he left behind. That's been the history all these ages. And now the remnant is not exempt from that persecution. But friends, through faith in Christ, we can endure to the end. Through faith in Jesus, we can overcome. And by doing so, we shall be saved. And not only will we be saved, but as Paul said about the Thessalonica believers, that they will become a witness to all those around them. That our faith will be the inspiration for those who come behind us. Friends, I wonder, is that your desire this morning? Do you want to be faithful to Christ? To endure to the end? To be a witness for him? If that's your desire, I'm going to invite you to raise your hand as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, the history of your church has been such that every generation has faced hardship and persecution. We see that with the believers in Thessalonica, and Lord, Satan has continued all down through the ages. And now he comes and continues. He's enraged with the remnant. He's enraged with your people that are trying to keep your commandments and have the faith of Jesus. And Lord, we feel those attacks in so many different ways. We feel attacks at home. We feel attacks at work. We feel attacks at church, whatever it may be. The battle is real. And Lord, help us to be steadfast in our faith. Help us not to give up. Help us not to become discouraged in whatever we're dealing with. Things are going to happen. It's expected. You had warned us that all will hate your truths and your character. But you have promised he who endures to the end will be saved. Lord, we want to be witnesses. And we know that the greatest attacks may come from within. And Lord, help us to realize the calling that you're placing upon your remnant. is not to only be shares of truth, but to truly love one another. Help us to guard our thoughts our actions, our words. Help us not to be the evil servant, but be the wise one who properly manages your household. Lord, we know that wounds can be deep and hurts can be strong. But we pray for your spirit to bring newness of life. Lord, help us to launch those arsenals on the real enemy. There is an enemy that's trying to destroy each and every one of us. And we know that greater is he who is in us than he who is of the world. We have nothing to fear if we look to you. So help us to learn these valuable lessons from an epistle that was written years ago. And help us to have that love as Paul had for those believers, to have that love for one another. Thank you for being here with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.